Um, some of you know me, again, I'm Wendy Dunlap. I'm with the Oracle Marketing Cloud. I'm actually with the agency partnerships team. So I consider myself an educator and an enabler. Uh, my role is really to make sure agencies know everything they need to know about data technology and this new ecosystem that we're all trying to navigate. So with that said, I've been working with data for about half of my 18-year career. Since about uh, 2007, I've been working with data and data management platforms. And I'm also a science fiction geek. So I have been waiting for the full realization of artificial intelligence since Skynet. Like, I'm ready. Um, and so I'm really excited and enthused to introduce this panel of experts to you guys today. Um, so just to name them off, and you guys can come up and take a seat. We have uh, Mike Margolin, who's an SVP, Director of Audience uh, Strategy at RPA. Mike. All right, we've got Brian Colbert, who is the GM of Emerging Technologies at iPon Web. We also have Akil Parak, Parikh, excuse me, who is an SVP at 4C. And uh, last but not least, we have JSD, Juan Suarez Davis, who is joining us from Crux. Thanks, gentlemen. So there are a couple of things that I want to accomplish, or a few things I want to accomplish with today's panel. I want you guys to walk away with a full working definition of artificial intelligence. I want you to understand what it is and the components that comprise an AI system. I also want you guys to be aware um, and have a working knowledge of the implications to the agency model for AI. But also, as marketers, I want you guys to have the knowledge of you know, what it takes and when and why an AI system should be integrated into a client and agency's marketing. So with that said, let's start with the definition. I'm gonna toss this to Brian. So we, we throw around a lot of industry terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, and I think depending upon who we're talking to, right, they, they can mean very different things. What's your working de definition of artificial intelligence? So for me, working from an AI perspective is that you have autonomous systems, systems that have enough information that are, they're able to make decisions on their own and to learn and actively grow from that, that basis. And you know, that said, over time, I see things moving in an AI-like direction, but I think the near term and the near term being five, within the next five years at least, it's very much a machine learning-based system where you have things that are practical and useful, but they don't really know what they're doing. Right? They're able to execute against certain goals. You say, this, this thing is what I want to have happen. Here's all the data about everything I know that's happening up until that point. You tell me what's going on. And if you have enough data that you can feed into those models, which we have in digital systems, even if you're looking at TV that isn't digital, you have enough external data that's going on. You know about the buy. You know about what media is on. You know about the type of consumption. You know about the neighbor. You have all of this data that's available. And while you could build an AI-type system that would direct that, um, it doesn't know what to do. right? You need a person to go in there and say, this is what is necessary to do. AI decides what to do within a different context. It has a goal. Machine learning just executes against goals. Says, this is or isn't going to meet the goal that I have in front of me. I want to get a click. So right now, there's a lot of machine learning around clicks and conversions and things like that. Um, and the problem is that those are proxies for things that people are really interested in. Right? So progressively, you get to, to the business outcome that's interesting to a user, whether it's an improvement in brand surveys, whether it's actually selling something, whether it's getting people to use their credit card more often. There's a lot of different things that are measurable outcomes. And those are all measured in a different way for different people. But the data coming in is, is in a similar format. So I, I see it as a, a goal-driven and an execution framework for machine learning versus an understanding of, of what the goals should and could be. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of agree with that because um, in my world where we are basically focused on um, uh, activation for social as well as TV and ultimately cross-platform, we're basically looking at um, a, a user input-driven um, action. So it's more like actionable intelligence where you're actually, the user's giving an input that these are my goals and based on all the data sets that I have available, give me the actionable intelligence that allows me to make a decision on where I want to run my ad, whether that's on uh, digital platforms or on TV platforms. Yeah, 
I, I just said what I, I also like the way Brian framed it up is that you know when we're talking usually with the C level marketing executives they they get kind of frustrated right they think we use we talk to ourselves way too much and so I thought you did a nice job right of saying AI is already here let's park it here for a minute the machine learning framework is a really good way for again senior marketers to get their head around these are actionable insights I can I can set machines loose to do something but to your point it's only as good as the inputs right and that's the art and the science of it and I, I think that if we if we can use that language, uh, we're probably better as an industry speaking a little bit closer to the C-suite, of the, you know, the marketing C-suite. Because uh, right now I feel like it's, uh, sometimes we get in this conversation, it's a little on deaf ears. And yeah, so let's break down the core elements of an AI platform, right? I think we've got a really good working definition of um, machine learning and decisioning and autonomy. What does it take to build that? What are those core elements that marketers and agencies should be compiling in order to have a fully functioning AI system? I'll talk about it from a technical perspective. I think you need to have, you need to understand what you're trying to get, right? So I, I, like I said, in digital, the, the outcomes are very, are things that can be measured. And I think there's a lack of creativity in, in how to expand that beyond just kind of clicks and views and things like that. Um, and that, that has a lot of side effects, which I would distract the conversation. Um, so you, you, need, you need to have an outcome. What is it that makes the difference to me? You need to have a way of, of measuring that outcome, whether it's a sales qualified lead, it's a marketing qualified lead. But the CMO is putting money into the budget to see something happen, hopefully drive more long-term purchases, short-term purchases, specific product sales. There is a goal behind that, and it tends to get diluted down through the value chain. I think it's better in TV, where you have a much closer working relationship between the advertiser and the, the producer of the content or the distributor of the content, where that share, uh, well, that's a different thing. Um, <laughs> where there's a big difference between those outcomes. So shared understanding of what the goal is, shared understanding of what the data is available, um, and then something to collect an action against that that's more sophisticated than a spreadsheet. Right? That you have so many data points that are coming across from so many points. And I think current buying approaches limit themselves to what people can understand and people struggle for understanding. So you need to have analytics, but the analytics are driven by the data. They're not just, oh, we think that this is gonna happen. It's a test and validate. It's a, it's a scientific experiment. Here's the data, here's the outcome, let's measure it. Did this make a difference? Did, if we drop the TV by, did that make a difference? So it's a framework for considering it. You need a framework to understand what your goals and objectives are and an easy way to activate that. Not this one off, oh, let's try this. Oh, that worked, okay, six months later, let's do this. But that, no one's learning anything in six months. You can't control for the variables. So I, I think part of it's just having a system that's designed to conduct experiments. So the analytics, a test and learn methodology, and an executional system, a plan right. of attack, of action. Yeah. And, and probably the most important thing is, is not a technical thing. It's a willingness to go where the data leads you, not what your preconceptions lead you to believe. So Mike, you're doing a lot of this work for agencies right now at RPA in, in building intelligent decisioning systems. Can you, can you add to that? I'm, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to hear the word system being used over and over again um, because uh, there are a lot of discrete places where machine learning and automation is benefiting things that we do, uh, whether it's channel planning, uh, planning a media, uh, media flight, uh, location analytics, understanding sentiment, um, natural language processing, there are a lot of discrete areas um, where uh, machine learning is advancing us. Uh, every marketer basically needs to have the right system for them um, based on whatever their business objectives are. Um, virtually every CMO will agree that what they want is growth and efficiency. Um, those are two really straightfo straightforward, high-level goals. The objectives that lead to those are gonna be really, really specific to the given marketer. Um, so, you know, for a long time, we've leveraged all those discrete types of um, machine learning and automation, and increasingly, we're looking to set forward um, this sort of journey to the ideal system. So, an, an existing system may be pretty simple, like a ad tech stack. Um, there's a DSP, there's a DMP, there's a dynamic creative platform, there may be a fractional attribution platform, and all those things, as discrete elements put together, can be pretty useful. Um, and then you start uh, thinking about all the other things, diff different data sources, different types of technology to solve different problems, how they get integrated in the system. Um, and that's really nice. And, and I think for many of our clients, 
we're going to be close to getting really solid systems there. I think the real end state that we're really pushing for is not a client-centric system about how to purchase audience groups, um, but a system that's actually based around an individual customer and pushing them through their uh, decision journey. Um, so recognizing the individual, how they uh, interact with a brand touch point. Uh, it may be looking at a tile uh, on an app screen. It may be interacting with the brand's website. It may be interacting with the brand in an advertising environment. It may be uh, owned media. Uh, and designing to different emotions to push those people through that. Um, so I, you know, I, I guess when we think about our ideal system, what we're kind of most excited about, it's this uh, very people-centric, DMP-focused data environment that's really based around that individual person. So let me, I want to pull something out of that. Um, we've, we've gone through the elements of what an AI system would entail. But let's say I'm a marketer, and I'm deciding whether or not to, in, to invest in AI, either with my agency or in-house. When and why would I do so, other than the fact that it's just a really cool thing to say that I did and there might be a great story in ad age? You know, what are the concrete business reasons to integrate AI into a marketing platform? Well, I do, I do think one of the f first things is this recognition that you're going to get greater value uh, out of a media investment with uh, more data points connected rather than disparate from one another. And it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a situated belief. There are some uh, uh, situated beliefs that are around, hey, if I could just buy the cheapest ad inventory, that's how I get efficiency. Um, but to be situated around, hey, if I can uh, connect insights, I can get greater efficiency um, through, that, through that intelligence, that collective intelligence. Um, and then from there, building onto use cases. Um, you know, we've had some of, uh, uh, occasions where a client has significantly invested into a big automation platform, and they spent, in some cases, almost as much money uh, on the tools and technology as they did on the media that they put against it. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, it kind of ends up being upside down. It's hard to look at that type of investment and say, hey, we actually saved money. Um, so, you know, we try to bring our clients through a data journey um, where we get initial wins with disparate pieces of that technology and then layer on one, uh, one after another. So, Akhil, I want to, I uh, you know, toss that question to you as well because you are building platforms um, to enable um, a lot of intelligent decisioning um, and marketing. Yeah. How do you talk to potential clients and partners about the benefits of artificial intelligence? Well, um, like I said, I, I don't necessarily talk about artificial intelligence. I talk about, um, and my job is uh, rel relatively easy because 4C is basically a data science company first. It's built on those principles where they've taken uh, disparate sources of data, for example, on social media, they've taken data from 1.4 billion users of public engagement data, and then they've combined with that engagement at the brand level and the affinity associated with that brand with a particular program and created uh, an o their own index that allows them to figure out, okay, which program has a stronger affinity with the brand and vice versa. Um, and they've established like uh, that affinity index with 25,000 different uh, brand categories, uh, interest categories and 50,000 brands. So that's, that's the premise. Uh, through which um, we, the, the company has been built. They've established a platform on the social side for, as a DSP that allows uh, agencies to basically target ads across uh, all the social media channels with one single workflow and bringing in additional data. What we're doing or what I'm doing essentially with 4C is extending that practice to TV. We're bringing that same technology, the same audience-driven targeting, combining social data with um, viewership data, and that viewership data could be Nielsen data, could be Comscore data, could be fourth wall or set-top data, or ACR data, and associating those uh, social affinities, plus um, we also own the largest uh, station monitoring network with Teletrack so that we actually know in real time what ad or what content actually was played in which network on what time across the 210 DMAs. So we actually combine all of these different data sets, bring them together, plus any first party or third party data sets that our customers actually license, 
combine all of that, use that for optimization purposes, and actually make recommendations on where the ad needs to be placed. So that's, the, that's on the planning piece where we actually allow you to say, uh, based on user input, that these are my goals with all these data sets, with all these target segments that I've created or uh, the systems enabled you to create, find me the most optimal placement opportunity. Where is the highest concentration of uh, the likely truck buyer, for example, right? And find out what is the likely uh, propensity that, we, that it will move the product, right? That, that is what we're after. And on the buying side, we're basically also focusing on automating the plumbing. So uh, we're doing deals with uh, all the programmatic SSPs out there. Uh, that are uh, providing programmatic inventory. So for us, it's, it's targeting both 100% uh, of the linear inventory, whether that's programmatic or non-programmatic, in a very data agnostic and inventory agnostic way. So for you and your business specifically, the benefits of AI, um, would it be correct to say it's around you know, driving the speed of decisioning and the efficiency of that automation? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it, it really depends on uh, what the client objectives are, but definitely speed, efficiency. Efficiency is, is um, you know, it depends from client to client. Certain clients operate, uh, every, everyone has their own uh, behavioral optimization tool, if you will, but um, how quickly can we take all of, the, all of that data, make decisions relatively quickly and bring that efficiency together and say, here is how we've computed billions and billions of rows of data in a few minutes, and here is the response where this is where it should be. What would take them weeks would be done in a matter of minutes or hours, if you will. So efficiency is something definitely we focus on. And you know, as someone who spent the majority of my career on the media side, that's a little terrifying to me, right? Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I want to transition to is sort of the value of human intelligence in all of this and how that, how this is going to impact the agency model. So JSD, um, Crux, you guys are reaching out to agencies, you're powering their data with your um, data management platform. Um, how are you seeing, or, or predict for me, how you see artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence changing the agency model and the roles and the functions of agency teams. Okay, I will, but you, you gotta promise to tell us why it scares you after this, okay? okay All right, because I, <laughs> I wanna know why it scares you. Uh, so I, you know, I joined Crux a year and a half ago, uh, well, and now it's, we're, today's day one of Salesforce. I, I'm supposed to say Salesforce today. Uh, and, but I spent the previous uh, seven years running the global North American media and digital strategy teams for Kellogg. So I spent most of my time on the client side um, and I, I think that, uh, I actually think it's a really exciting time for agencies. I know it, 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 it's the favorite whipping boy, unnecessarily the favorite whipping boy of the industry that was talked a lot about uh, for those uh, who were at the ANA Masters of Marketing in Orlando uh, last week or two weeks ago. And I think the reason why it's the whipping boy, right, is it's because it's an easy place to go to and the way that it's largely been built on a pyramid with a lot of you know, smart, highly paid people at the top and just a crap load of FTEs at the bottom is a problem. That being said, um, I, I really do believe, and we've got some great with Mike and, and various other examples, that agencies that are willing to pivot and put a lot of human capital into, I guess maybe Brian's larger definition of AI and machine learning and analytics, uh, are gonna win. And, and I actually think they're gonna become even that much more valuable. So uh, if you take a, so largely in, in crux with, with large marketers, so these are agency teams of, you know, 75, 200, 400 FTEs, right, on a global basis. And that, what's gonna happen, and is already happening, but you're gonna shift, the power is shifted from buying power to targeting or intelligence power. That's fundamentally where the shift, I see it, at least on the agency side. So, um, yes, if you're a low level, you know, kind of in the cog planner, media planner, and executioner, you're, you're, you're gonna have some trouble. Those jobs will continue to uh, be even lower value and will eventually disappear. If you can elevate and the agency can elevate their value to the client by using technology and again, really unlocking rich insights and human intelligence, um, not only are you gonna win, uh, I would argue that there might even, there's a price premium for it. Because on the flip side, what we're seeing from marketers, whether it's zero-based budgeting, if you've heard of ZBB or, very, you know, it's, it's Herculean effort to get headcount uh, in the marketing department, right, a large marketers. And so I think there's this interesting balance where the agency, if they can elevate, get the right people in the right place, 
um, they're going to command a premium, and you're going you're gonna to have a, a, an agency marketer relationship that's really actually quite healthy, even as we go through this incredibly turbulent time. Okay. I think that's an optimistic view. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I, I think that there's two, I think it's a, there's two big challenges, and it's whether it's an agency or a consulting firm. Um, one is the current business model is based on body shops, right? Their fundamental model is to, you know, basically yeah, pay for those expensive people at the top with lots of, you know, marked up labor. Um, that labor gets disintermediated very quickly by machines as soon as the incentives are aligned for people to do that. Um, the second thing is, this is technology driven, and I don't know any technologist in bulk that would want to go work for an agency, right? It is not the place that those people want to go. It's not the culture that they want to be in. It's not the motivation that drives them. So I think that's a very challenging, same for consult. I think similar for consulting, not quite as bad. But if, if you're looking at kind of the mindset of who is thinking about things in these ways that can bring those tools, they are not people who are going to be attracted to that kind of an environment. So I think that's like a, I mean, okay, maybe it's a harsh criticism, but it's not, it's a structural problem. It's not that an agency doesn't add value. The agency has tremendous insight and value and can bring it there, but I think it's a big gap between where they are organizationally and what is needed to have happen. And, and that has nothing to do with technology. Yeah, I, I agree. I especially agree with that first point. My only, and it may be semantics, but I don't think it's technology driven. That, that's my, and that may be the only difference. I think it's just still a human business. A building brands is, a, is an emotive. I think, you know, we talk a lot, right, about data, and yet we still know that the creative and the message is at least 50, if not 60%, most of the, the most important part. So right. I think we're, we might, we're probably agreeing. We're maybe just slightly different semantics. Right, but it's the, the, the people that are providing that value that have that insight, that get that creative, that resonates with the audience, that really understand the brand story. That's not what is making the money for them, right? They're making the money off of the labor to execute and plan those campaigns. And that was the first part I agree. Right, with. Yeah, and I think gotcha. that's, I, I, like I said, I think that the agency has tremendous value, right? I think it's, I think creative is probably the biggest thing that's overlooked in totally the process agree. and some of the previous things. Like, so it, it's not that it's there's not a necessary role, but I think it's a it's a cultural conflict between the culture of a technology driven, data driven organization. No, obviously this is a broad statement, but I think that's the bigger challenge, right? Brian, I'll, I'll, remain I'll, relevant. I'll agree with you on, on the fact that the old agency model that was more pyramid uh, shaped and had a lot of junior level planners pushing a lot of paper, that th that's, no, that's not the future. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think any agency that believes that that's going to be the future is going to be, um, well, that kind of agency is going to be extinct. They don't code. They don't design algorithms, but they actually, they really know how to leverage uh, our clients' platforms. So they're the ones um, that are getting trained on leveraging you know, different types of technology, whether it's social sentiment data, uh, whether it's fractional attribution data, and understanding how to operationalize it within the workflow. And that's just on the media side of things. On the creative side of things, we're talking about things like uh, storyboarding experiences. How do we you know, design ads that push uh, uh, emotional resonance at different stages in the, in the customer journey. So when you think about an agency being situated around those things, well, there are a lot of people that are excited about being in that yeah. type of agency. Um, in fact, recently we've, uh, we've shifted over a number of people that used to be digital planners to being digital buyers, and they're working with more and more parts of the ad tech stack. And these people love it. Yeah. I mean, they come into work and they feel challenged every day. They're, uh, they're able to, um, to interact in, in, so, in so much more of an active way uh, than they did in the past. Um, so I, I actually think that there's a lot of viability and it's a pretty exciting time to be in the agency. You know, it's interesting that you bring up, um, you know, sort of consumer journey mapping, right? Because I think that, you know, agency folks, we love to talk about the art and science of what we do, right? Um, and sometimes it's, it's intentionally to overcomplicate what is really <laughs> simple. Um, and I think that artificial, well, artificial intelligence um, is going to operationalize um, or take away some of those operational functions in the agency world, and we'll see those go away, right? Some of those lower skill level FTEs. I think that the art piece, though, is really significant. And the ability to identify what is going to move a consumer emotionally, right? What is going to influence their favorability and those cultural associations, which is just not, it's not done by creative alone, right? It's also done by media placement and content alignments. And just do getting you, the context that someone's, yeah. In the context, mm -hmm. exactly, right? And so do you see a future where artificial intelligence can realistically replicate that? 
I think it's more likely that um, existing uh, platforms like uh, virtual uh, per, uh, personal assistants uh, and uh, chat, uh, chat bots in messenger apps, I think that's probably a more likely uh, scenario where AI is operating that because it's a really closed environment. Um, it's a relatively straightforward system with straightforward protocol. Um, you know, there's a reason why there are, I think, 3,000 uh, skills that Alexa has and 11,000 chat bots right now on Facebook Messenger. It's a pretty fixed protocol. Um, so those are doing a very specific task. Once you lift it out of that kind of really um, clean, pristine environment and you start thinking about what a marketing organization needs to do, uh, it, it becomes a lot more difficult uh, to expect AI to solve all of the problems, uh, uh, the, big, the challenges, uh, econometric issues, things that pop up you didn't consider before. Um, so there, there's, a, there's gonna be a certain amount of human stitching and coaching that's gonna need to happen between the disparate elements, uh, even in environments where there's a certain amount of AI that's taking root, connecting this piece to that piece within the system is gonna be really uh, important. There's one other thing that I think is really worth, uh, worth noting. Um, in, in the first seven years or so that we've been doing programmatic marketing, um, uh, we've been seeing uh, this troubling trend uh, that we need to continue to push against, that our clients need to continue to push against, and it's this uh, concept of um, reductive testing, um, where you optimize yourself sort of into a corner. Uh, and there, there isn't a, a constant testing of new hypotheses, um, introducing new variables that may, maybe you didn't even consider before. Um, I actually don't like the idea of art and science. I, I think it's, uh, um, I think it confuses uh, people and it sounds like marketing bullshit. It's supposed to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Um, but, but you know, when, you, when you, you know, realize that, hey, machines are really, really good at doing these simple tasks and also in learning certain things over time. But if you actually don't introduce things for them to learn whether they work or not, it's never gonna learn that until we get to true artificial intelligence and yeah, then we'll all be just sitting at home on fixed incomes <laughs> and the machines will run the world and that's Skynet. Yeah, <laughs> so let's talk about for a moment the cross-channel implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, because when I think of AI, my mind uh, immediately just goes to digital applications, right? Um, and how AI is going to enhance our display and our social and our, our, our video tar or online video targeting. But there are uh, real implications of AI to broadcast, to TV, for example, which we've spent a lot of time talking about today, as well as radio. And so how do you see, are there specific areas that AI can enhance and influence broadcast channels such as TV um, and transform that even more so than we're seeing within true or traditionally digital platforms. Can I ask a question as we answer? Are you saying in its current linear state or are you trying to merge to like the, the content of it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, in the convergence, specifically in the convergence, because I think that to talk about linear TV today is to talk about a dinosaur, right? Um, TV is converging, we see the direction it's going, um, and we spent a lot of time speaking this morning about programmatic and TV and what that looks like, and is, is that realistic to expect TV to even be fully programmatic and data-driven, um, and you know, what segment of TV can truly realize that? And so I asked that same question about artificial intelligence. So, uh, I, there's two parts. I think one is if you look at the machine learning element of things, right? So I fly a lot, um, way too much probably. And I tend to fly United, and United has partnerships with different airlines or uh, hotels and things like that. And in the seat back entertainment system, they show the competitor's commercial, right? United knows what seat I'm sitting in, they know where I'm going, they know how frequently I'm going. Like they have tons of data about me, right? Which I willingly provide them. They do nothing with that data, right? Now, a simple machine learning system could dramatically alter that equation, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's like a simple step where that AI just kind of replaces this basically rote system that doesn't have a lot of intelligence in it. If you look at TV, and, and I think that if out of home is gonna evolve and become more clever in, in, in that respect, but I think if you look at TV, the, the, the trend that 
has kind of been mentioned, but is peripheral is the content of how people consume that content is not just it's going to converge, but it's just going to fall off a cliff at a certain point, right? I don't know when that is. I have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I can't imagine in 10 years that TV exists like it does now. I can't imagine that people of that age will consume TV like we, they just won't do it. They have no experience, they haven't got the training, they have zero incentive to do so. And so at, at that point, you have, to, you have to have driven that whether anybody wants to or not, the, the choice is there, the choice is abundant. And so the, the, choice, the choice of cons consumption. The choice where of consumption, and the, the choice of consumption is ubiquitous. You get to choose everything, whether it's VR on your phone, and so you have to have that data. People cannot make those decisions. AI, machine learning, whatever variation has to come to the point. So I, I think it's, like people were expecting, and this is getting maybe too far off, but the, a machine to be able to play Go independently compared to chess to be decades off. It happened last year, right? So at a certain point, it will tip over to the point that the system can just do it by itself, right? And it doesn't, it, it understands enough to be effective and what that is being driven by is all of these technologies coming into play for people looking to monetize that channel. So um, TV itself, I think, has to be radically rethought. I think a lot of people are doing interesting things. But you pry it by, by hand, and then you start automating it. Because you then go back and start iterating over the experiment as to what comes next. Because what's coming next isn't very far away. So I think it's sooner rather than later. I, I think there are going to be some incremental steps made in, in the next uh, in the next year, uh, as more and more marketers connect their DMPs to their adjustable TV buys, um, I think there's going to be enough evidence um, and, uh, and interest around it. I think it's going to be more around machine learning and optimization uh, I, I, rather than true AI. Um, but we're going to take steps in the right direction this year. I, and I hope these two gentlemen are right, because I'm probably jaded. And even being on the DMP side, it's just, it just seems like it's snail's pace. I, uh, you know, and maybe because I bought, you know, Three quarters of a billion dollars at TV. <laughs> Man, I would have thought we'd been farther than where, where we are today. And you know, sitting with let's see, three of the top, at least fifteen top advertisers in Orlando, boy, I didn't I I did not see much progress on the broadcast side. I saw a lot of testing on, you know, whether you know, going out. We talked about demo, but going outside demo and, and getting into you know affinity based and just some actually un, in, in certain ways actually took step. <laughs> said their use of using, um, you know, uh, using uh, uh, POS data on Affinity actually showed worse returns than demo because, quite frankly, spill and waste on big CPGs is their friend. <laughs> you know, as you get more targeting, you know, sometimes you have unintended consequences. So I, 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 I think, think you're, I think you're right, but I think category it's, though. Hmm? I think it'll vary from category. Oh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you're in, you're, heck, you're in automotive, which is weird, which is fascinating, right? I mean, you, a lot of automotives will. Go away. Go fre frequency plow the, <laughs> the living hell out of, out of uh, linear. All right. So we are uh, winding down. We've got a few minutes left. And I'd love to add uh, or leave some time for a couple of questions. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to ask you guys to take 30 seconds each to uh, tell me about an AI platform or technology that you're really excited about and why. Uh, and I'll just kick it off. Um, it, it's somewhat of a, a self-serving plug. I'm really excited by the adaptive intelligence apps that were announced at uh, Oracle Open World this past September, uh, where we're developing um, these uh, artificial intelligence applications. You can kind of view them as APIs in the sky or in the cloud um, that are uh, really purpose-driven. They integrate with um, other data uh, and technology platforms. They allow for supervisory controls so that marketers can um, control the decisioning if their corporate policy um, and other dictates that the AI system needs to be aware of. Um, and so they, they really allow for fully flexible machine-human, human-machine interaction. But more importantly, these adaptive intelligence apps also integrate blue chi data. Um, and so the implications of having that data integrated into artificial intelligence and decisioning, I'm really excited about and, and really looking forward to partnering with a lot of our clients um, and executing on this uh, in the near future. JSD? 
Well, since you said that, I can only, I have to say the you Einstein product, otherwise I would be shocked yeah. on this chair. <laughs> um, and in all seriousness, and, and it's in the sales side, it's not in the marketing side, so it's not uh, the um, a Dreamforce. I was fascinated to see the Einstein uh, artificial intelligence brought onto the sales side, on the B2, B2B side, because it's not an area of my expertise. So I was absolutely blown away at, uh, at, at the uh, artificial intelligence. That's kind of what you just said, <laughs> probably for a good reason, right? There's lightness there, um, and how they were using that both, again, the human elements, sort of the emotive state of where they were in the sales process, and then the artificial intelligence that, at least from my perspective, could be combined to increase that, that customer journey. So um, I was fascinated by it. That was mine. I would say that um, the, the work that's being done in public, um, like Microsoft, Google, General Electric is even announced, well, that's basically these open, these open machine learning platforms that are able to do deep learning, they're able to leverage hardware, um, and basically bring your own model to what's interesting to you. And then now that you, you look at all of the work that's being done basically to create an ecosystem where you have access to the ability to program media, the access to buy media, now you can bring intelligence in a way that makes sense for you. So it no longer has to be this one-off thing that you have to have you know, a cadre of experts just to get that insight. You can experiment using these tools um, pretty much for, for anybody who wants to. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, but personally, I think, um, you know, driverless cars, that's a personal interest of mine, <laughs> yeah, just on the front of uh, AI, but I think um, well, more so with uh, some of the things that we're doing at 4C, I think are worth mentioning because um, they're going very much in the direction where uh, today you can run a social ad uh, across the social media channels and you could do a conquest or you could based, uh, you could trigger um, uh, a weather ad, uh, weather related ad in a specific market where it's raining. Uh, today that's at a click of a button, uh, but we are getting to a point where we're activating that the system automatically recommends the user that, hey, the weather is bad out here, do you want to run an ad as an advisory for this particular? So, and we're going in that direction because it allows us to actually, the system is proactively making recommendations based on the data it has and the triggers it can make to make a recommendation so that it still is human driven but uh, or human um, execution, but it's, it's the, the triggers are there that are actually allowing uh, users to make decisions based on real time feedback that it's getting into the platform to make certain decisions about media. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go someplace totally different. Um, you know, Apple gets knocked uh, for a little bit for their, uh, for their software development, uh, and everyone loves their hardware, um, but the photo uh, app in the new iOS 10, um, for those of you who have not uh, enabled the uh, facial recognition feature, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I have an almost four-year-old boy, and uh, I, I, I enabled the caching uh, and indexing uh, and uh, processing uh, of all of the photos of him, and you know, I can spend 10 minutes just looking at him from the day he was born uh, all the way to today uh, in a series of different albums that are created that are absolutely beautiful. Uh, and you know, when we think about designing to emotion, like, wow, that's powerful for me. You know, that's uh, um, you know, leveraging technology that was developed in one place, merging it with another type of technology, creating AI around it, and then creating a truly emotive user experience. Can I get one super quick that's not a plug? Okay. Really good? Uh, Watts, just because I just saw Watson, um, nothing to do with us, uh, but there was, they did a thing, I think it's Campbell's, and a fascinating real live experiment about taking all the, all the first party data, all the recipes and ingredients, and then somehow piping in weather and various others to come up with the recipes. In and of itself, that's not that interesting, but the accuracy, and then when you really started to understand that they were doing it by all these other layers, right? by where they were, geography, the temperature, multi-ethnic. It, it really blew me away. And I, I worked in food for many years, and I was like, holy crap, that's, <laughs> you know, that was truly impressive. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a really cool thing. It's all these discrete technologies that get turned into structured data, they get combined yeah. together into a single system, and then what you do with that system can be beautiful and really It's a work of art, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, it's a great brand, and the most important part is a great brand experience. For on the other side, that was actually why it was most impressive to me. It's like, okay, that's, that's a really fantastic brand experience. So just not a beautiful marketing execution, but a value to the consumer. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Utility yeah. and, you know, motive. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thank you.